Well, Chancellor Herman, Professor Greeno, members of the various communities represented here, Champaign-Urbana and the campus community. I'm deeply honored to be giving this inaugural lecture for two reasons. First, my wife and I, Julia, have spent our lives here. We've raised our three children here in this community. We have great affection and appreciation for many people in town, including many of you who are here tonight. Uh, if, however, you're looking for members of my family, you won't be finding them. After we decided upon the date for this lecture, no easy task aligning all of our schedules, we learned that our middle son, Daniel, was to be honored for academic achievement at uh, Central High School tonight. So my family is there where they should be, and um, I'm here, and I owe him big time. <laughs> the second reason why I'm so honored to be giving this lecture tonight is that I have many friends and colleagues scattered around the campus. We all know this is a very big campus, and when I first joined the faculty 16 years ago, I did what you usually do in a big place. I stayed close to home, uh, building strong connections to members of my department, the entomology department, and the neuroscience program. But as the years passed, my circles expanded to include enlightening collaborations and important friendships with many people all over campus, other science units and various colleges, engineering and computing, library science, the social sciences and humanities, and the professional schools. And now I can really say that the whole campus feels like home to me. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share with you some of the fruits of our research on honeybees. But let me begin uh, first with uh, part of a story, not a whole story yet, part of a story not about a bee, but about a person. So a guy walks into a 7-Eleven uh, convenience store, uh, very well dressed, and uh, orders a 7-Eleven. Uh, excuse me, orders a grape Slurpee at the 7-Eleven. The clerk notifies him that uh, they're out of the grape Slurpee. So what does the guy do? You're going to have to wait till almost the end of the lecture to find out. But I will tell you, it's not the beginning of a bad joke. It's actually a deadly serious story that we'll come back to in a, in a little while. First, we have to uh, really build up the information that we need to evaluate that story that I'll tell you later by getting uh, closer, up close and personal with the honeybee. The honeybee is able to accomplish really some awesome things, and I've listed three here for you. Symbolic language. The bee, the honeybee, is the only creature outside of humans that's known to have a truly symbolic language. So this is a remarkable uh, achievement for this little critter. Food. Thanks to honeybees' pollination activities, $14 billion worth of food in America alone per year are, is produced. Without the pollination activities of the honeybee, here is a white beehive right here, here is an apple tree in bloom. Without the pollination activities of the honeybee, our diet would be much poorer. We wouldn't have fruits, nuts, many seed crops, uh, all sorts of dairy products due to the reliance of, of the seed crops in, in that sector. So honeybees are very, very important for our economy. And then finally, right over here, honeybees, uh, one of the more well-known species that have given rise to this new field of biology, invasion biology. I'm sure some of you have heard of the infamous killer bees. That, yes, you've heard of those? So it's actually an overblown story, but um, it really has a kernel of truth in it and has led to a serious dis subdiscipline in biology um, called invasion biology, looking at how and why species are able to move so freely from different parts of the world and the ecological consequences. So honeybees are able to achieve magnificent things, but with what? <laughs> Here we have the brain of, of a human. I'm not sure if it's Richard Herman's brain, although I understand that's a very popular brain in calendar <laughs> circles. But here we have uh, the honeybee brain. The honeybee brain is the size of a grass seed. A million neurons in the bee brain, a hundred billion neurons, almost a million less neurons, uh, order of million less neurons in the honeybee than in the human. So they're overachievers. They're really overachievers. How do they get all of this done? Well, what we're going to do in this lecture is, as suggested by Proverbs, we're going to really get up close and look at some of their activities, some of their habits, and see what kind of secrets we can learn to their success. Now, you'll notice I didn't really have the nerve to change this verse from Proverbs, but um, ants and bees are related to each other, so it's really OK. 
So the secrets of their success. We're going to look first at their social behavior. We're going to look at their brain. And then we're going to look at their genes. These are the lessons that we learned from tonight. And so I'll give them to you right now. And then we'll go through them one by one. First of all, decentralized organizations work. Brains are shaped by experience, even in bees. Social behavior is built from solitary behavior. And we'll think about a Lego-like model as the father of three boys, thousands of dollars worth of Lego. This analogy came very easy to me. <laughs> Fourthly, genes talk big, but they actually work small. And then finally, nature and nurture really are not all that different once you understand it properly, because they both act on the genome. So let's begin with their social behavior. So first, let me introduce you to the cast of characters in a beehive. There are three different kinds of honeybees in a beehive. There's the drone. This is the male bee. If you look up the word drone in Webster's Dictionary, sorry guys, you'll find it means lazy. As far as we know, the male honeybees exist for no other reason than to mate with the queens. They perform no other function, as far as we know. And I won't be extending that comparison in any way at all. <laughs> the queen. The queen lays all the eggs in the hive is, and lays about two, up to 2,000 eggs a day, over 2 million eggs in her lifetime. She stores the sperm that she obtains during the matings um, in her body for several years at 93 degrees Fahrenheit. We're still working on technology for sperm storage, humans freezing it, all sorts of things. The honeybees have figured this out a long time ago at 93 degrees Fahrenheit, I might add. And then finally, the workers. The workers are the ones we're going to be talking about today. The workers are the bees that engage in all activities related to colony growth and development. So they're the stars of the lecture tonight. The main aspect of their success in, at the level of social behavior is their social organization. They have a division of labor, which is sort of painted for you evocatively here. There are different individuals that are doing different jobs. There are some individual worker bees that work inside the beehive, and I'll show you some more realistic shots in a few minutes. And then there are some bees that work outside collecting food from flowers. This is based on a pattern of behavioral maturation. That is, bees grow up and do different things as they grow up. So um, an adult worker bee lives about six weeks. And she spends roughly the first two and a half to three weeks working inside the house in the beehive. And then at about three weeks, she graduates and becomes a forager. Here are some landmark events in a bee's life. The first major activity is taking care of her younger sisters. Recall the queen lays all the eggs. So we have a family with one mother, many, many daughters. And the older sisters are taking care of their younger sisters here primarily. This bee is known as a nurse bee, and I'll be using that term a few times as we go along. Then, after about a week or so of life, the bee enters middle age. Seems kind of quick. I just turned 50. I also think it happens kind of quickly. <laughs> At middle age, bees engage in taking care of the hive, building the structure of the hive, cleaning it out, removing debris, and so forth. And then, as I said, at about two and a half to three weeks, they make a transition to becoming a forager. Um, at that point, they spend all of their waking hours when food is available out in the field on flowers that you see them and collecting nectar and pollen. You'll notice this cartoon bee is carrying a compass. Bees have a home. They know where they live. They learn the landmarks surrounding their hive before they graduate and become a forager. And then they go out. They will fly around for maybe 30 minutes to 60 minutes, visiting literally thousands of flowers. When they've collected a full load of food, they make, pardon the pun, a beeline back to their hive and unload the food and then continue in that way. So here are some more realistic pictures. This is a nurse bee. This is a honeycomb right here. Inside these little holes, and these holes are called cells, will be a little teeny tiny larva, a baby bee. And this is an older sister sticking her head in and feeding the larva here. And so that's what a nurse bee does. And then a forager, I'm sure you've all seen bees on flowers. And so this is a forager bee right here. Now, this sounds, as I just described it, like a very stereotyped sort of system. When they're a certain age, they do a certain job. And that fits with most people's notions of insects as little tiny robots. But it's actually much more complex and interesting than that. Because in the case of the honeybee, they can adjust their behavior. They can adjust how fast they grow up 
in response to the needs of the colony. So they're able to assess the needs of their colony and change how fast they grow up. They can speed up, they can slow down, they can even reverse their pattern of maturation. And no, I won't be selling any such substances at the end of the lecture to make you young again. So they're able to do all of these sorts of things. And they have to. It's important for them because it's really tough to make a living off of flowers. Here are some data from a friend and colleague of mine, Tom Seeley, at Cornell University. And on the y-axis, the vertical axis, we see the daily change in colony weight. And on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, we see the, a time period from May to July in Ithaca, New York. Here is the zero line. And what you should notice from this slide is that there are only a few days of the summer when the bees are able to make a profit, when they're able to gather and collect more food than it takes them to run this vast operation of a honeybee colony with 40 or 50,000 adult bees and about 20 or 30,000 immature bees growing there. Most of the time, they're breaking even or even losing. So it's tough to make a living on flowers. Flowers contain tiny amounts of nectar and pollen. They are only available when it's good weather. And so it's very tough. Very few days are they able to do this. So it's hard. They have to adapt to changing conditions. When you have a situation like this, where they're bringing in, look at this, up to six kilograms in one day, they have to be able to have a mobile, flexible workforce to adjust to those bonanza conditions to take advantage of that and get more foragers out there when they can. So they're changing external conditions. They're also changing internal conditions. It's a very complicated slide. The only point of it is to show you, if you just look at this configuration of bars, each color bar represents a different life stage. As you go through time, you see that it changes. The age demography of the honeybee society changes over time, which means if you're a 10-day-old bee and you're over here, you may find yourself among the oldest bees in the colony. Whereas if you're a 10-day-old bee here, just a couple months later, you may find yourself among the youngest in the colony. So how old you are is a rough indicator of where you are in life, but it's not good enough because of all these changes in external and internal conditions. So bees can respond. How do they do this? They're able to accelerate and become precocious foragers about as early as one week of age if necessary. Who's in charge in a bee colony? How are they able to do this? We, in, in human societies, are used to the kinds of things that, that are shown here in the slide. We're used to a chain of command, organizational chart. Here's an NSF, National Science Foundation, organizational chart. Some of my colleagues are probably writing down some of the names there to get an edge on their next grant proposal, but just relax. Here, the Wall Street Journal evokes the idea of a labor market. You want to know what's a field to go into. You have the Wall Street Journal. What that means is centralized control. Individuals gather information, process the information, and then other individuals obtain that information. They have less information than another group. So it turns out that bees do not use the, the form of organization that we mainly use, which is centralized control. They use decentralized control. And I want to show you results from a couple of experiments that support this notion. Here's our current understanding of it summarized here. There is a, a process whereby old bees control young bees so that the more old bees that are in a colony, then the more inhibition goes on, the slower is the rate of maturation of the young individuals. Let me show you some results that support that statement. First of all, let's set this up. So here are the way bees live. Um, in, in a managed situation. These white skyscrapers are beehives here, and um, they also live in holes in trees or in other sorts of cavities. So there may be 30, 40, 50 different bee colonies. Each one of these vertical stacks is a family, has a queen, and has a large worker force, and is an individual entity. So we open up one of these beehives, we see it teeming with thousands of bees. Here is a one-day-old adult bee just emerging from the honeycomb. We can put a colored numbered plastic tag on her so that we can make detailed behavioral observations. And then we have the bee in a beehive. Here's a smaller beehive. And we look at the age at which she becomes a forager. This turns out to be a very robust 
behavioral trait to study. The bee appears at the entrance to the hive, right here, and she takes off, disappears from view for maybe 20 or 30 minutes, and then when she comes back, she tells us what she's been doing. She's covered with dust, pollen dust. She may be collecting a whole load of pollen, so her legs are full of this material. If she was collecting nectar, which they then make into honey, she would have a distended abdomen. So it's quite easy to observe this at the entrance. And so we have uh, individuals who sit at the hive entrance, record the age at which the bee becomes a forager. So I'd like to tell you about some social engineering on bees. We can make young and old populations. We can make colonies that have an old population or a young population. And that's what you see on this graph here. And what this graph shows is that the more old bees in a colony, the slower is the rate at which bees grow up. So on the horizontal axis, we have the percentage of old bees in a colony. On the vertical axis, we have the number or the percentage of young foragers. And you can see the more older bees in a colony, the fewer there are of the young foragers. So old bees delay foraging by young bees. Another experiment that supports this idea. Here is the world's smallest beehive, one bee, in a little dish with enough food to stay alive. When we did this experiment, we actually thought this bee and bees like this would never grow up. They're lacking social stimulation. They're lacking um, any sort of, of uh, oversight by the older individuals. There's no queen. There's, there's nothing. Um, so we really thought that that was going to be the case. We were totally surprised to see the actual opposite. And that's shown here. And that is, if you grow up in isolation, you grow up faster. So here we have the number of bees. And then we have them classified as either foragers or non-foragers. We had two different kinds of bees. Bees reared in a normal colony, enjoying all the life of a bee in a colony, or isolated. You can see this pink bar here relative to this yellow bar showing many more isolated bees becoming foragers prematurely relative to the colony bees, colony reared bees. So this work led us down a, a, a line of study that finally culminated in the discovery of a new pheromone. A pheromone, if you don't know the term, is nature's perfume. These are substances produced by one member of a species that cause another member of that species to change its behavior. So we discovered a new pheromone. Uh, for those of you interested in the chemical name, it's ethyl oleate. And we were able to uh, find this material. We showed that it's present in greater amounts in the forager than the young bee, which is what it had to be in order to be consistent with our ideas. And moreover, when you treat it, which is this experiment here, when you treat colonies with ethyl oleate, you delay the onset of foraging. And that's what you see here. Here's a control colony matched for genetics, matched for the size, matched for the time of year, and so on and so forth. Um, relative to its partner, and the only difference was that this one was treated with this substance, you can see that the mean age at the onset of foraging, the average age that bees begin foraging, is higher in this treated colony than the control. Now, this is an experiment, like most experiments, we have to convince ourselves that we're on the right track. We did this experiment 14 different times, different trials. We actually did it two continents, three different labs, um, and we were uh, finally able to convince ourselves that indeed we had found a new pheromone. So what we then see is social inhibition of behavioral maturation in an ingeniously simple system. So the bees don't keep track of how many old bees there are, how many young bees. It just works because the more old bees there are in the colony, the more encounters there will be with an older bee just by chance alone. So they will get a higher dose of this inhibitor and that will slow down their rate of maturation. You remove the foragers, which we do experimentally or can happen under natural conditions. You remove this source of inhibition. The younger bees grow up faster. So they don't need the Wall Street Journal. They don't need an organizational chart. They don't need a chancellor. They're able to work in this way, in this decentralized way, and, and appear as if they are highly organized using this decentralized approach. This approach has captured the attention of other individuals. My colleague, Feniaski Peña Mora, in the Department of Civil Engineering, is leading an NSF-sponsored program that seeks to look to biology to get, to, new, to get new ideas about how to organize humans, especially under critical rescue-type conditions. 
So Fanny Osky's uh, student is, is working with me. We've been, he's been doing an independent study on bee biology. And we just had our first paper accepted by a journal that I've never published in before called Complex Systems, which is spearheaded by Fanny Osky Pena's Mora's work um, on this interface. And so we are looking forward to a lot more fruitful exchanges between um, these approaches. OK, let's move on to the brain. I don't know how many of you have heard this. This made quite a splash last year. Cabbies in um, the United Kingdom have a larger hippocampus. The hippocampus is a part of the human brain that is known to be involved with spatial learning. And so it was shown that these cabbies have this larger brain region. And this was attributed to the fact that they know their way around. They're learning spatial rep representations. At least the good cabbies are. And they're then showing this effect of their experience on their brain. Well, it turns out that bees also show this. It's not exactly called the hippocampus. There's an analogous brain region that's called the mushroom bodies, which is outlined for you here in red. So now this is a, a thin section that you're looking at of a bee brain. And it's stained in such a way so that this part, called the mushroom bodies, is highlighted for you. This part gets bigger as bees grow up. And it's biggest in the foragers. How can this be? Well, we can look at the individual neurons. These are now schematic diagrams of individual neurons. Here is a neuron of a nurse, quite sparse in its branching pattern. Compare that to a forager. Why is that important? The more of these branches that there are, the more ability the neuron has to communicate with another neuron. The way our neurons work, all neurons work, is they communicate by sending chemical and electrical messages to each other. And so the more branches there are, the more connections there are. So this is a highly significant uh, development that occurs where the cells get more connections. This increase in connections just takes more room, increases the volume. But that's not the important part. The important part is the business part where it's creating more connections. The cells can talk to each other more. They can operate more efficiently. So this happens in a bee. Here is an actual slide of a so-called Golgi stain that shows one of these cells. This was done by Sarah Ferris, a former graduate student working in the lab. And this work that I'm talking about now is a collaborative effort uh, with the laboratory of Susan Farbach, a longtime collaborator. So here we see the cell, this fo these forager cells, showing this intricately branched pattern with the potential to make many, many connections with other neurons. So the idea that foraging experience actually contributes to the growth of the honeybee brain was demonstrated beautifully by current graduate student Nyla Ismail, who's in the audience, I believe, right up over here. And what Nyla did was compare the brain, and specifically the mushroom body, of bees that were in a very sterile environment, this cage right here, just a few bees, otherwise nothing else going with it, compared with naturally collected foragers. But it doesn't exactly look like that, but um, it's a pretty picture, I think you'll agree. And the point is the bees are uh, exposed to a variety of stimuli under natural conditions. What Nyla found is shown right here. So here we have three different um, conditions. We have the cage control condition. That, remember this cage that I just showed you? That's the zero bar right here. Then we have bees with two weeks of foraging experience, getting a chance to see all sorts of flowers. And then one group that I didn't tell you about, a group of bees that were confined to the dark hive. They were not allowed to get out by some techniques that we've perfected over the years. So what you see, this is the zero line. So this is the, the size of the mushroom body, that's the name of the brain region, in the cage controls. Look at this, uh, about a 16% increase in the volume of this brain region with exposure to the environment. Bees in the hive have a little bit of exposure to stimuli, and they show oh, about a 4 or 5 percent increase in volume, but nothing like the forager. So experience-dependent changes in brain structure in the honeybee. This cabbie effect can be seen in rats, too. My good friend and colleague Bill Greeno pioneered this line of study in rodents, and here's one of his classic experiments that shows a rat in an enriched environment full of toys and stimuli that have to be learned to be dealt with. And under these conditions, the rat also shows an increase in particular brain regions as a result of experience. So this is kind of interesting. 
we've got the cabbie in England, we've got the rats in Bill Greeno's lab, and we've got our honeybees um, showing this same effect. Why is that interesting? Well, here is a phylo phylogeny, a set of evolutionary relationships between organisms. It's, for you evolutionary biologists, it's, I know it's not the most updated one, but it makes for a good picture. There's room for the pictures on either side. <laughs> and what it shows is something very important. The last common ancestor of the social insects and the vertebrates lived some 600 million years ago. It's thought to resemble this creature right here, a, a flatworm, a marine flatworm, with very, very rudimentary brain, if that, no social life to speak of, and yet we see all these striking convergences, social life here, social life here, experience-dependent changes in brain structure here and here. This raises profound questions about how is it that separated by 600 million years of evolution, we see similar things. Well, there are two concepts in evolutionary biology to explain this phenomenon. One is called convergence, one is called conservation. Conservation is something like this. We all know that the genius of the SUV idea was to take a truck and all the innards of the truck, the base of the truck, the engine of the truck, and just put a new top on it and have a new vehicle. So the insides were conserved between the SUV and the truck. Convergence is brand X comes out with an SUV, sells like crazy, and so all the companies say, hey, I want to have a vehicle that looks like that too. So we have convergence. Notice that no brand is, is mentioned because at the University of Illinois we're not endorsing any particular uh, manufacturer. <laughs> so those are the two concepts, convergence and conservation. What, what do the data look like? Well, um, we are taking a molecular approach to get at these questions. And here are now some more data from Nyla Ismail's uh, PhD. And what I want you to understand is that an Alzheimer's drug, that is a drug that was developed to treat Alzheimer's, a certain category of drugs, works on honeybees also. So we have some of the same data shown uh, as before. There are many more bars than we need for tonight's purposes. I want to call your attention to this bar here. The drug is called pilocarpine. You'll recall these are our two-week foragers. Remember, they had about a 15% increase in brain volume for the mushroom bodies. Well, the pilocarpine treatment causes about the same effect. but these bees treated with pilocarpine were never foraging. They were in the cage. The only difference is they were given this drug. So they have this huge increase in their brain region volume that, that mimics the effect of foraging. You can see the two are really very similar. These asterisks represent a significant difference from the cage control. And in fact, there's barely any difference between these two. So taking a molecular approach, we see the, the, the hint here that there is some very deep conservation of the brain and its response to the environment. So that doesn't rule out some aspects of convergence, but it certainly says two things. That conservation, even though we have this very primitive ancestor here to, to reckon with, even though we have this, it suggests that at a very deep molecular gene-like level, we see conservation. And it's this kind of success that is leading us to pursue this approach at the new Institute for Genomic Biology. As you heard the chancellor mention, we have a, a large and wonderful interdisciplinary team that is aimed at using genomics, using the study of genes and the genome to get new insights into behavior and brain function. The idea being that by going down to that very deep level, we'll be able to understand the role of conservation and the role of convergence in shaping complex traits such as the plasticity of the brain. So finally, I turn to the third and final topic, which is genes, secrets of success from honeybees at the level of individual genes and the genome. So we begin by talking about one gene, and that's called the foraging gene. And what this slide does is summarize um, a lot of work that compares the role of a particular gene called the foraging gene in Drosophila, the famous fruit fly, and the honeybee. In Drosophila, this gene gives rise to two different kinds of flies. There are sitter flies and there are rover flies. 
They are genetically different. And the reason why they behave different is because of their genetic difference. They have an inherited difference in this gene called the foraging gene, abbreviated for. And this leads to this behavioral difference. They have a very, the sitter flies have a very limited foraging range. The rover flies much more extensive. This genetic difference or inherited difference is, gives rise to the fact that the, for, the expression of the foraging gene is lower in the sitter flies than in the rover flies. In honeybees, we see an interesting situation. So historically, we saw these results. They came out in 1997. They were published in Science. We were very excited about them. And this now refers to the work of a former graduate student, Yehuda ben Shahar. We were very excited about this, uh, these developments in flies because we thought, well, nurse bees also have kind of a limited foraging range. They're mostly in the hive, whereas foragers, of course, go out and forage quite extensively. So we wondered whether this gene might be involved in the changes that go on from a nurse bee to a forager. Now, remember, we're talking here, the nurse bee is not genetically a different bee than a forager. It's just a younger bee. It's going to grow up and become a forager. That's a developmental change, whereas this is a genetic difference. So that kind of added the right spice to be able to see, might this gene be working in a similar way, but in two very different contexts? So emboldened by that, and by the intriguing difference in foraging behavior, flies, another creature with no social life, when they're hungry, they go get something to eat. Honeybees have this extensive social life. The foragers go out not when they're hungry. They go out when food is available in fl for, with, from flowers. They actually eat before they go out. They go out to collect food, bring it back, and feed their younger sisters or store it for a rainy day. So the whole idea of hunger has been played with in very interesting ways in social evolution in honeybees. So for because of these, this set of similarities and differences, we explored the role of the foraging gene. And um, what Yehuda found is that the foraging gene indeed is involved in honeybee foraging. And if you increase the foraging gene's activity in the honeybee, you can get foraging to occur early. So let me show you the data to support that. So here we have nurses in the pink and foragers in yellow. On the vertical axis, we have the amount of gene activity for this particular gene that's measured in the amount of messenger RNA. And as you can see, the foragers have two to three times greater gene activity for the foraging gene as measured by amount of messenger RNA in their brain than do the nurse bees. And this is a highly statistically significant result. And then as I said, if you treat bees in such a way as to cause this gene to be more active, you can get precocious foraging. So on the y-axis here, the vertical axis, we have the cumulative percentage of bees foraging from each of these different groups. These groups represent different treatments. The pink group was a control group. They were in the cage for a few days, like that cage I showed you before. They were just given sugar syrup. These other groups were given different doses of a substance that increases the activity of the foraging gene. These two high doses, the black curve and the blue curve, caused a statistically significant increase in the number of precocious foragers, meaning if you activate this gene, you can get early foraging. So a causal relationship between gene activity and this socially mediated behavior. So that's exciting, a foraging gene. But are there really foraging genes? Are there mean genes, fat genes, IQ genes? We read about this in the paper. Uh, the journalists use this as a shorthand. I have nothing against journalists um, at all. We scientists use this also. We call this gene the, the foraging gene. But it oversimplifies the situation, builds up the genes into an unrealistic-like uh, situation. And we get to something like this. So here is some person's conception of the, the Y chromosome. So, um, here's the sports page gene, buddy. We have uh, the RIF gene. I'll skip over some of the genes that I don't care to mention in public. But uh, here's one, total lack of recall for dates, the oops gene. So is this really what it's like? No, not at all. This is an oversimplification of what genes do. The foraging gene we used to develop an approach that gives us a more realistic understanding of what genes actually do. So we asked the question, how does the foraging gene influence behavior? The foraging gene, by the way, encodes a gene 
encodes a protein that is an enzyme that does many different kinds of things. It's a kinase, which is involved in many different reactions. And I mention that because that puts the, that puts the uh, issue more squarely before us. How can something that catalyzes so many different reactions, how can we stand up here and link it to a behavior when it's doing so many different things at a physiological and a molecular level? So the way we chose to pursue this was indicated in this slide. We take a sort of Lego type analysis. Let's, okay, we've got this big fancy schmancy behavior foraging. I've been gushing about it all evening. Let's break it down. Let's see what components it's actually made out of. And one thing that's been very helpful is to try to get an idea. Let's get into the bee's head a little bit. What motivates the bee? And for division of labor, uh, a very simple model to explain the motivation of the honeybee is something called the response threshold model. And here's a little cartoon that explains how it goes. You're walking down the city street. There's a bakery and a flower shop. And you are hungry, so you smell the bakery. The next day, you're walking down the same street. You've now fallen in love. It happens overnight sometimes. And now, you smell the, the flower shop instead of the bakery. The stimuli haven't changed. What's changed is internally your responsiveness or sensitivity to these stimuli. So the response threshold model works very nicely for thinking about growing up as a bee and how you go and change occupations as you get older. The idea is when you're young, your responsiveness to the stimuli associating with foraging, associated with foraging is very low. Their stimuli could be there raging around you. There could be dancing bees. There could be intoxicating nectar. All sorts of things happen. You're very young. You're not responsive to those stimuli. You get older and older, you become more responsive to those stimuli till finally they tip the scales, they're strong enough to elicit the performance of the behavior of foraging. So that's the response threshold model. When we, once we put foraging into this schematic, into this context, then we can say, okay, well, what are some of the stimuli that are associated with foraging? One of them is responsiveness to light. I mentioned in passing, but didn't really emphasize, bees live in a dark hive and then they go out and become a forager. So it's reasonable to suggest that maybe their relationship and their responsiveness to light changes as they get older, meaning they could become more responsive to light. The term for that is positive phototaxis. So I also must admit that we got a hint from some of the results from Yehuda's analysis. Here is a cutaway of the bee brain, and here is an analysis that shows where in the bee brain this gene, the foraging gene, is expressed. And what Yehuda found is that it's shown, and see those dark blobs there, it's shown to be expressed at higher levels in these areas that are highlighted for you. These are areas that are involved in processing visual information. This is an area of the optic lobe involved in visual information. And this is an area in our friend, the mushroom bodies, that's a particular subregion of the mushroom bodies associated with processing visual information. So here we have this gene showing this striking pattern of localization in areas associated with processing visual information. And we have the whole conceptual analysis that I just went through with you about positive phototaxis. It suggested that maybe the way that this gene, or one of the ways that this gene affects foraging by behavior is by causing the bee to become more responsive to light. And that's exactly what Yehuda found. He used a, an assay, a simple behavioral assay, where you put bees in a cage, and it's in a darkened laboratory, except for this light source right here. You turn the light on, the bees come to the light, or some bees will come to the light. You quantify how many of them come to the light as a function of whether they're nurses or foragers or in response to a particular treatment that activates this gene. And what Yehuda found is shown right here. Um, indeed, the foraging gene does affect phototaxis. I'll get to that in a moment. That's on the right. But first of all, the basic premise has to be that foragers have to be more responsive to light than nurses. And that's, in, fa in fact, what he found. So on the vertical axis, the percentage of bees responding by coming to the light. And you can see yellow as foragers, black as nurse. Way more foragers come to the light than do nurse bees. Now, is that just because foragers are more active? No. Yehuda repeated the experiment, this time in the dark, to remove that difference. And when he found what he found here is that in the dark, they're equally mobile or immobile. So it's not an effect of their mobility. It's 
their responsiveness to light. So armed then with this information, he used the same treatment, which those of you are interested, is a form of cyclic GMP that activates this gene and found that he could turn young bees into bees that are very responsive to, for, to light, not as responsive as foragers. You'll notice almost 100% of the foragers, here it's about 45, 50%, but way more than the control bees. So this says that one of the ways, perhaps not the only way, but one of the ways that the foraging gene affects foraging behavior is by affecting phototaxis. A lot less grandiose sounding, but much more realistic. Okay, we're back to the grape slurpee story. And I warned you, it's not going to be funny. The story begins in my class. I, I uh, teach a class in genes and behavior. And a number of years ago, I gave it as a discovery class. Many of you know that we have this great program on campus, the discovery program, where um, groups of 20 freshmen are in a classroom with a senior faculty member for uh, a special class. I taught the genes and behavior class once as a discovery class. And um, we covered a particular gene. Uh, and each, each week, the assignment was to understand and describe some of the technical aspects of this particular gene and behavior story, and also come up with a human interest scenario that relates to this. So this story that I started to tell you before, and I finally will finish now, was actually what students came up with, freshmen came up with, um, to engage the class in a discussion. So you heard the first part, guy walks into a 7-Eleven, very nicely dressed, orders a grape Slurpee, and is told that um, they're out of the grape Slurpees. Takes out a machine gun, shoots everyone in the 7-Eleven. Uh, he's, he's arraigned, he's booked, and his lawyer immediately has him tested for a genetic mutation in a particular gene. And it turns out he has a mutation, which has been shown in other populations and in animal studies to increase aggressive, to be associated with increase in aggressive behavior. So the dilemma, the case that these two freshmen put to the rest of their class was, what do you decide? Do you have this person guilty of manslaughter, not guilty by reason of insanity, or take some medicine to repair this genetic problem, and it's a realistic scenario actually in this particular case. Um, upstanding citizen, never before in trouble, felt terrible about it, and, and take this medicine and you will then be able to lead a normal life. So for an hour and a half, the class debated this issue. Gets right to the heart of it. Gets to the heart of where all of this work on genes and behavior is going to go. And at the heart of the heart is the issue of nature and nurture. So of course, for years we've been locked into this uh, terrible dichotomy of nature versus nurture. That is, that we explain behavior on the basis of heredity or environment, or actually more precisely the way the debate is put, genes versus the environment. And what I want to talk about now for the final few minutes is how the lessons from the honeybee gives us a new perspective on the nature-nurture problem. So we seem not to have much of a problem linking genes to certain kinds of behavior. So there was an advertisement that uh, appeared on television last year during the US Open that started with this line, the right genes make all the difference. It showed Andre Agassi and his son um, in a commercial, something like this, didn't raise an eyebrow. I mean, it was, so, it was so palatable that a corporation felt it could be aired without uh, fearing any repercussions. But of course, things get much dicier when we move from tennis to other sorts of behaviors. Um, personality, intelligence, social traits. And the issue then really becomes, is it really so polarized? Is it really so black and white? If you're giving a nod to the genes, does that automatically diminish the role of the environment? Does that automatically diminish the role of free will? Nature and nurture for too long has been seen in this very polarized way, an enduring polarizing debate that really has spawned extremist views on both sides, on the side of nature, Nazism, and on the side of nurture, Marxism. So we have the situation. We in the scientific community are a little bit smug because we've gotten past nature versus nurture a while ago. We know this is wrong, and we talk about nature and nurture, heredity 
and the environment. But I think that's not good enough. It's possible from the lessons that we're learning from the honeybee, in the study of genes, even the foraging gene. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. It's possible to articulate this whole um, situation differently to get a perspective that I think is much less polarizing. So let's go back to the foraging gene. We have the same gene, the foraging gene. It can show differences in activity in the brain due to both inherited and environmental factors. In the flies, it's an inherited difference. These are genetically different flies, the sitters and the rovers. In the honeybee, same gene, but now it's a developmental change. A nurse bee grows up, and associated with growing up is a change in activity of that gene. So that leads to this insight here that I'm presaging here. The horns of a dilemma are usually on the same bull. Nature and nurture are actually acting on the same substrate. They're acting on the genome. There are hereditary effects on the genome. There are environmental effects on the genome. DNA is heritable and sensitive to the environment. That's the key point. So this new perspective is based on an emphasis on what genes do, not who they are. Let me illustrate this with now a genomic study, and I'm using the term to refer to a multi-large gene study rather than a single gene study. There are racial differences in bee behavior. Honeybees, the European honeybee, exists in many different races. The bees that we have in America were brought over from Europe. And in America, the racial differences are not maintained. So in order to do this experiment, uh, my, at the time, for, uh, postdoc, Charlie Whitfield, had to go to southern France to do this experiment. You know, it's tough to be a biologist. <laughs> so he went over and studied racial differences between two races of honeybee, the Lagustica bee, which is the Italian bee, and the mellifera bee, the German bee. These are, these are all honeybees, just different races or subspecies of the honeybee. What was found is that, first of all, there are differences in this trait that we've been talking about all evening, how fast a bee grows up and becomes a forager. Lagustica bees, the yellow bars, grow up faster. So you see the higher yellow bars in whatever colony they're in. So again, on the vertical axis, the percentage of bees that are foraging, and they're foraging either in a mellifera colony or a Lagustica colony, doesn't matter. There's always more Lagustica bees foraging, meaning they grow up faster. So we see heritable differences in this particular behavioral trait. Now we switch gears and look at the activity of thousands of genes using a new technique uh, called a microarray. Each one of those little spots represents a gene, and the color that you see represents how active that gene is. We compare nurses and foragers. The first thing that we see is that, OK, we've been talking about the foraging gene before, but many genes show changes in activity as a bee changes in behavior. In this particular experiment performed by Charlie Whitfield, a former postdoc who's now on the faculty right here, 40% of the genes in the bee brain show differences in activity. Let me explain this slide a little bit more for you. So here we see, going across, each of these little lines, these rows, is the activity of a gene. Going down, we have an individual bee. So what we have here are columns that represent, oh, about 60 different bees shown here in this particular slide. We have some young nurses and old foragers, YN and OF. Then we have bees from an experimental colony called a single cohort colony, where we uncouple age and behavior. We have young nurses and young foragers, old nurses and old foragers, and the colors that you see represent levels of gene activity. The yellow is a greater than two-fold difference, nurse versus forager, and the blue is a less than two-fold difference, just mapped in the other way. Here are two clusters of genes from this microarray experiment. These microarrays are known as gene chips. They measure the activity of thousands of genes. Here are the data from two clusters of genes. There are about 500 genes in each of these clusters, and they're clustered on the basis of their similarity in expression or in activity. So you can see that these genes really track behavior very nicely. That is, this set of genes, by and large, is upregulated, showing higher level of activity in nurses relative to foragers, regardless of their behavior. Are you with me? Yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, right? Another cluster. Different genes show 
Just as good tracking, but the opposite direction. Those genes are lower, down-regulated in nurses relative to foragers, nurses, foragers, nurses, foragers. So we see lots of changes in gene expression. These changes reflect the behavioral differences. And getting back to the point, many of these genes, when we compare the gene activity of the Italian bees and the German bees, show differences both due to heredity and the environment. So with the foraging gene, we had these differences in two different species. Fruit fly, hereditary, honeybee, um, the environmental differences, these developmental changes which are socially regulated. But here we have literally hundreds of genes that show this profile themselves, that they are different in activity due to heredity and due to the environment. Moreover, many of the genes that we've been identifying in the honeybee are known to operate in the human brain, and these genes are showing the same kinds of patterns in other animal models. Pair bonding in voles, care for offspring in rats, are other have other examples of genes that show this kind of versatility. So really then it comes down to the following. It's all about time scale. Inherited differences in gene activity evolve over a very long period of time, from generation to generation. That's what nature is. Environmental differences in gene activity occur over shorter time scale within an individual lifetime, and that's what nurture is. So I'm hopeful that this perspective can lead to a more diverse uh, agreement or agreement among diverse groups of people who are interested in behavior, and particularly biologists and those who study humans from the social science perspective, humanities perspective. There's been quite a difference in perspective for quite some time. The biology perspective, which tends to be at least characterized, characterized by a genetic perspective, is seen by those on the social sciences as being very rigid. Those who study behavior very carefully say, I study human behavior. Human behavior is not rigid. It can't be that way. It's more flexible. The gene activity mindset provides a common ground. It says you don't have to throw out genes if you don't think behavior is, uh, is, is, is rigid in that way, because it's not. It's flexible. We all know that. We see that in honeybees, flexibility in how fast they grow up. So this gene activity mindset allows one to take into account the role of genes at these different time scales so that they can be included in a realistic model of human behavior. This is important because we're really going to need to join forces with social scientists who study behavior and know behavior so well. Biologists will have to join forces with social scientists to really deal with the issues that are before us that are going to be confronting us with related to genes and behavior. What role will genetic profiling be playing? How will we come to grips with these kinds of new studies and new information and the concept of free will? And this is a case where we really are going to have to join forces and work together to study humans because although I've been waxing enthusiastically about honeybees, as yet we have no honeybee model for free will. So let me close by saying that honeybees are real overachievers. They're tiny. They're small in the big scheme of things. But with their social organization, they're able to achieve um, great things. They've also given us some lessons that I've tried to present to you tonight. First of all, decentralized organizations uh, can, can work, at least in certain circumstances. Brains are shaped by experience, even in bees. Social behavior is seen as being built from modules, simpler modules associated with solitary behavior, a Lego-like model for the understanding of behavior. Genes might talk big, like that Y chromosome picture I showed you, but they actually work in very small ways. And then finally, nature and nurture are not really all that different. They both act on the genome. I'd like to close by thanking those whose work I spoke about tonight, former graduate student Yehuda Ben-Shahar, undergraduate Anne-Marie Zico, undergraduate Nicole Dudek, former graduate student Sarah Ferris, former postdoctoral associate Zachary Huang, current graduate student Nyla Ismail, former postdoc Charlie Whitfield, former graduate student Ginger Withers, and our current technician, Karen Pruitt, who's contributed to all of these studies. I mentioned the work of several collaborators tonight, Susan Farbach, 
uh, Yves Leconte in France, I think I forgot to mention his name actually, Marla Sokolowski from the University of Toronto on the foraging gene work. I'd like to acknowledge the Keck Center for Functional and Comparative Genomics, which was the first genomics institution that Harris Lewin put on the map here at the university, which made um, the, a lot of this work really possible. And of course, we're now, and Harris is leading the way into the next era, the Institute for Genomic Biology. We're poised here at the University of Illinois to be one of the real leaders in genomics. And it's because of Harris's leadership and the support of the higher administration that this is possible. And I think you're going to be hearing lots of great things coming out of the Institute for Genomic Biology in the future. And I'm really excited to be moving there next year. So with that, I will close. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to take questions. I only have one request, and that is that you use the microphones that are placed on the aisles here so that people can hear um, on, on the web where, they're, where this is being video streamed and if there are any people in the other room where they can hear as well. Gene, that was uh, wonderful. Um, what was the substance that regulated the forager gene, and what is known about how that will foliate the pheromone that affects things, and does it affect the forager gene? Thank you. The, the substance that affects the foraging gene is 8-bromo, uh, I'm speaking to a chemist now, 8-bromocyclic GMP, a membrane permeable form of cyclic GMP, and so it activates the PKG, makes PKG more active. The ethyl oleate, we're just doing the experiment to see what genes it does affect. We've done a similar experiment with another pheromone that has a similar effect to that pheromone, which is to delay the onset of foraging. And we predicted that it would downregulate genes that are usually up in foragers, and it does just that. Gene, you mentioned the, um, the work with Alzheimer's, that sort of stuff, but can you speak a little bit about G, uh, bees and their ability to remember and ability to forget? Mm -hmm. Ah, the forgetting part is a really, really interesting part of that question. So bees have uh, quite an amazing memory. They have uh, the different forms of memory that have been found in vertebrates. They have a short-term memory. They have a medium-term memory and a long-term memory. They're able to remember the location of uh, certain profitable food sources for days. They, of course, remember where they live for their entire life. And so their memory is really quite well developed. Forgetting is actually a very interesting um, point. So um, as a postdoc, I did a study that had nothing to do with what it was talking about today and had to do with um, when a honeybee colony gets big, it divides into two. And that's called swarming. The swarm uh, will leave the parent colony and it will eventually settle in a new location that is pretty close to the parent colony. So they use a sort of Amish farmer conservative strategy. If it was good enough to support the family to get to a certain point, it's good enough for the new family. But that poses a very interesting navigational problem because I don't know if you've ever done this, but when we've moved, um, if we move too close from house to house, you get to a certain landmark and where your old house was, you make a left, your new house, you make a right, but you get to the landmark, you make a left. So for honeybees, this would be like you get to the oak tree, the hive they grew up in, they were supposed to make a left, their new location with the swarm is a right, and so wouldn't they get mixed up? They don't. They relearn the location of their new hive. So I was explaining this to a more senior scientist, and I said, yeah, it's, it's really amazing. The bees forget their old location, and they... Uh, they learn the new location. He said, uh, well, how do you know they forget? I said, well, didn't you just hear what I said? They, you know, instead of making a left at the oak tree, they make a rice. Uh, you didn't really say anything about forgetting. So he was right. So we went out and we did an experiment, and it turns out they don't forget their old location. They just preferentially use the new location, but if we force them to use the old location, they will. And so they retain in memory the old location, but they will use the new location. 
which raises all sorts of questions about forgetting. Is forgetting an active process or a passive process? What, is the, what are the sort of the economics of that? Like, is it, is it more expensive to erase a memory? Or is it just there and there's just such excess capacity and it just decays in terms of these connections between nerve cells? I don't think really anyone knows. Everyone's busy studying learning and memory and forgetting is something that we really don't know. Is it an active process or a passive process? Yes? The uh, rate of progression of the bees from uh, one stage to the next have any relation to the rate of aging of the bees? That's a great question. Yes, it does. Um, so when bees are in the hive, they are almost not aging. They're aging a little bit, but almost not aging. They're very well protected. They're fed well. It's like a fortress. Their mortality due to extrinsic conditions is very, very low in the hive. But when they become a forager, the clock is really ticking. There are all sorts of risks. They might get eaten by a praying mantis. They might um, get caught in a, in a storm. Um, and in addition to that, they're just wearing themselves out. They literally work themselves to death. So I said that worker bees live for six weeks. That's during the active season, during the spring and summer and early fall. A bee that's born this time of year will live for months inside the hive because she's not foraging. So the two are very much connected. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the, the different lines of communication that, uh, aside from the pheromones? Are the dances uh, involved? And how do you mentioned uh, profitable sources of food? How is that communicated through the colony? So um, bees have some internal standards that they use when they're out foraging. So they can distinguish a sugar solution that has high amount of sugar compared to a weaker solution. So for example, I touched upon pollination in the beginning of the lecture. Um, honeybee colonies are rented for many different uh, crops. One of them is pears. Pear growers have a real issue with honeybees because they pay good money for the honeybee colonies. They put them in to their orchards, and then when they go around to check, they see the bees on the dandelions instead of the pear blossoms. <laughs> the reason for that is that the dandelions have higher sugar concentration of their nectar than the pear blossoms. So they have to go through all sorts of management contortions, mow the orchard floor, change the honeybee colonies regularly to bring naive bees in, and so forth. So that's a long-winded way of saying they have this internal level of, of quality that they use. So they're out in the field, they're experiencing flowers, they come back to the hive, and they integrate several aspects of their foraging experience into the dance. The first is to dance or not to dance. If the food that they found was okay but not great, then they might not dance at all. They might come in the hive, have the food unloaded, and there's nothing to brag about, and so they don't brag about it. And so they might then wait and attend another bee's dance to see if they can be recruited to a better source than theirs. However, if they do decide that the food that they acquired is good enough to dance, and I'll throw a wrinkle into that in a moment, if they do decide that, then the vigor of the dance represents their assessment of the overall experience. How much nectar they were able to obtain, how easily, and what the quality of that nectar is. So they integrate that information in the vigor of the dance. The more vigorously they dance, the more likely they are to recruit other individuals. And so that's how a colony is able to focus its, recruit, its foraging force on the more profitable food sources. I said I'd throw one wrinkle into it, and that is there's social modulation of the likelihood to dance as well. So I made it all sound like it was an individual process. But when the bee comes back to the hive, this is now the work of Tom Seeley at Cornell University. When the bee comes back to the hive, she's formed an opinion, as I just said, about the profitability and so forth. But now what she needs to integrate is her assessment of the quality of the food and the colony's need for the food. If the colony doesn't need the food, then she's going to become much more persnickety and may not dance. Whereas if the colony is really hard up for the food, then her standards might go down, and then she will dance. You might wonder, how does she get that information? Just simple cue theory at work. If a colony is very active in foraging, then 
that when the bee, when the forager returns to the hive, she enters, no one's around. She kind of gets the cold shoulder. All the bees are really busy, you know, busy as a bee, doing all these things. Whereas if the colony's hard up for food, there's a lot of inactive bees. As soon as a forager comes in, she's mobbed by other bees who want a little taste of what she found. So the time to unload, the time it takes for her to enter the hive, and then a sort of a clock is ticking in her brain. We need Martha Gillette to figure out that clock. There's a clock ticking in the brain. The amount of time it takes for her to be unloaded then is a cue for her as to the colony's need for the food. She integrates that at the final piece, and then she's able to um, decide to dance. Yes? One of the issues of, of free will is that humans can make bad decisions. Do bees make bad decisions, and what kind of social control uh, is exerted around that? Yeah, that's a neat question. Um, bees have been recorded to make some bad decisions. Um, so here's, here's one case. Uh, so I was talking with Doug before about the um, swarm. And there's a, an interesting part to that that I didn't talk about before. So when a colony swarms, I said they move to a new location. How do they decide where to move? Actually, they send out scouts. And the scouts look for available pieces of real estate, and they assess them the way that a forager, a, a flower forager, a food forager does. But different criteria, of course, because it's for a place to live rather than uh, food to eat. But the scouts will go out, they'll scour the countryside, they will look for a hole in a tree, a hole in a building, and they will get information about these potential sites. They integrate that information using similar form of the dance language. And the basic dogma is that a colony will not leave until there's consensus. So uh, the dance looks like this, a, a waggle on the vertical comb, and the angle of that represents the direction to the location. So if you see a swarm when they're first starting to look for a place to live, it looks like a faculty meeting. There's one waggling this way, one waggling that way, <laughs> one waggling that way, and you have that. But the swarm won't leave until they're all waggling for the same direction. One time there was a swarm that never could agree on it, and they actually split in two. That's a bad decision because there's one part without a queen, and without a queen, they're completely lost. So that's sort of an anecdote. The, the, con, you know, the study has, it has never been really a systematic study. You get these sort of breakdowns of social order, but the consequences are severe. And whether that represents free will or not, I have not a clue. <laughs> Anything else? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>